Uh, my name is Michael Milligan. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm the uh, Assistant Director for Application Development at the Minnesota Supercomputing Center. Uh, and I'm going to give uh, sort of an overview of the different ways that we use Jupiter. We might use it in so many different ways that, uh, as my talk title suggests, we've come to think of it as a one-stop shop for our interactive HPC needs in general. So I'm going to start this talk with a little bit of a story. Uh, probably it was uh, when I came back from the 2014 SciPy meeting, really, really excited about this IPython Jupyter ecosystem that was uh, taking shape. And I pitched it to my managers at, at MSI, as was before I had my current role there, uh, and said, you know, this, this is something that we really should support. This is something that our, our users are, are starting to pick up on their own, uh, jumping through various hoops to run IPython on our compute uh, resources. And it would be really great if we could put something together around this. And my managers basically said, sure, we can think about that. But you can't just be the Jupiter guy. Uh, we have to think about this more holistically. We have to make it part of our service offerings in a sensible way. And so I went away and thought about that. And where we ended up is this. Uh, I convinced MSI to commit to support interactive HPC as a first class service. And they said, great. You're the interactive guy now. So then I went away and uh, spent some more time trying to define what do we mean by interactive HPC? Why is this something that's important, that's worth devoting resources to? And because I was still really, really excited about Jupiter, how do I make Jupiter integral to that picture so that I also get to play with Jupiter? So we started making a case for interactive HPC as a foundational service, that's some, uh, something that a center like ours should offer. And we started by looking at what does the computational landscape look like for the services that centers like ours deal with. And we find that in the past, we had this kind of computational dichotomy. A lot of the work that our users did fit into one of two buckets. Uh, either things that were small and interactive and local and ran on the fly. This is the kind of thing that a researcher would do on their laptop, on the workstation in their office. Maybe they buy like a really beefy workstation to shove under a grad student's desk and they do their computation there. But that was about the extent of it. And it's probably managed by that grad student until the grad student graduates. And then it's managed by no one. On the other, the other big bucket was the sort of things that HPC centers like ourselves worked with, where you have, and these are characterized by words like large and scheduled and remote and professionally administered. Uh, this is the work where a user would submit a job to a cluster, and the, and the user doesn't have to think about how the cluster is managed, we do that. Uh, but the user's trade-off is that, well, they can't get real-time feedback, and they have to learn the sort of arcane language for writing job scripts. And so there's a bit of a barrier to entry. But once they've done that, then as long as they can fit their work into this scheduled cluster paradigm, they're good to go. However, in the future, which of course is now, we found is increasingly not really fitting into those two clean buckets. Uh, for one thing, we've, we have serious competition for Mindshare and it goes so, like something, something cloud. Is, uh, we, we keep hearing from many angles, well maybe we can just do something in the cloud and not have to worry about this arcane cluster that you people have built. In addition, computing is presumed to be remote and interactive more or less by default now. Uh, you think something as simple as opening up a word processor is it likely as not to be a session in a web browser running on Google servers, not a program running on your own computer. And people expect that kind of behavior in their computational work as well, even when that expectation isn't necessarily reasonable. Moreover, non-professionals have immediate access to very large and professionally managed resources because again, you do say a search in your favorite search engine and you're accessing a very large uh, professionally managed uh, computational resource without having to think about how it's managed, hopefully. Sometimes the internet goes down. And a core consequence of all this is that we have users who have access to much larger resources, who have immediate access to these sorts of professionally managed services that they don't have to think about how they're managed. But this doesn't mean that they suddenly know what they're doing. So we start thinking about what are these use cases. 
experience is what are their challenges? What are the stories that drive these users? And we find that HPC is probably thought of as part of a larger research workflow. So the stories sound like, well, oh, Dr. So-and-so needs to explore a huge data set. This data set came from somewhere, and this exploration is going to lead to something. Maybe a paper will be written at the end of the day. But at this phase of the research, Dr. So-and-so needs interactivity, needs an analysis tools, needs maybe large memory and storage to be able to get at this data set. Or Dr. Such-and-Such -such is preparing to create a cutting-edge simulation visualization. You know, it's one of these simulations of uh, the entire universe, or they've simulated uh, some very complex hydrodynamic problem, you, know, you name it. And for that kind of thing, uh, you need interactivity, you need remote visualization so you can see what you're doing. Uh, you probably need a lot of compute sort of on demand, and you need some bandwidth to be able to get at the voxels you're creating, to get at the pixels you're rendering. Uh, in, in an interactive fashion. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you may have a grad student who's at the early stages of prototyping an algorithm. And this algorithm, again, they want interactivity so that they can rapidly iterate on the development of the software that they're working on. And then in addition to that, they need some kind of access to development and debugging tools. They need the time to iterate, uh, which means they don't want to be burning enormous amounts of CPU cycles just to sit there and think about, wait, you know, maybe how should this work again? And, you know, as uh, Fernando alluded, you know, we have brains that need some time to cogitate on stuff, and you would like to not be burning resources while you do that. I actually pulled a quote from an uh, article that was published in uh, Scientific Computing World this month. Uh, this has been said many times by many people. Uh, in this case, I'm quoting Andrew Jones at uh, NAG. It's not an IT facility. It's a research facility that happens to have been built with IT components. What we're, what we're managing is not a rack of homogenous computers that's going to serve a billion ad impressions. What we're building is a comp computational resource that's going to be used for research purposes in cutting edge ways that we can't anticipate and by users who have very advanced needs that in turn we can't anticipate all the details of because what we hope is that they are doing something fundamentally new. So we need to give them general purpose tools. Now in my current role I'm managing the application development group at MSI and so I have a very keen sense of the kinds of things that application developers at a center like ours spend their time doing. And to enable this interactivity, one of the core things you come back to is you need interfaces. You need interfaces that are interactive. And traditionally, these can take a lot of forms. You have graphical sessions, which could be remote desktops or it could be individual uh, applications that are being run through X-forwarding, uh, or they could be GUI applications running on a terminal in a computer lab somewhere. And then of course there's web interfaces, which can be bespoke application gateways, bespoke workflow managers, existing data management tools that have been brought in. Uh, really, the spectrum is very large in that space, and it's growing rapidly because this is sort of the default way people expect you to build applications now. But then, of course, there's a good old command line applications, too. And people use command line applications for all kinds of things, for file management, for scripting. Uh, most uh, centers are going to have their own local suite of utilities that do site-specific things. Uh, and then in addition, there's various scientific applications that are CLI only still. Uh, in fact, that's quite a lot of them. And what I find is that application developers at an HPC center wind up spending a lot of their time building interfaces to things, not developing computational applications. Because most of the time, I mean, the ecosystem out there for computation is large and robust. And if a user's coming to us saying, I don't even have software yet, the right answer is probably to point them at some software that can do more or less what they're trying to do, not to write something from scratch. But if they're coming to us saying, I want to create an interface to this cool thing I've developed, that we might uh, decide that we need to write because it, it doesn't exist yet. So everyone in this room probably knows where I'm going with this. As it turns out, you can, you can make Jupyter do most of these things. Uh, some with just out of the box, some with some shoehorning, but some shoehorning is still way better than writing software from scratch. So let's take a look at what that looks like at, in the case of the, uh, the 
Minnesota Supercomputing Center, I'm going to look at three key use cases. We have our headline HVC notebooks service that I'm going to talk about. And then in addition, we have application-specific science gateways that we develop for uh, project-specific use cases. And then even more uh, sort of contained, we have transient notebooks and resources that might stand up for workshops and training. So taking the first one as sort of the pattern that the rest will follow. Uh, some of you may have seen me present this flowchart before. This is a flowchart depicting the architecture of our HPC notebook service. So this service was designed with the idea that we need to use our existing HPC clusters. We're not going to stand up a new cluster just for doing Jupyter things. Uh, we want to use our existing scheduling technology for the same reason. And we want to use authentication technology that exists because that's already deployed, it's already audited, we're not going to have to go through some process with auditors and security people that will probably get uh, shot down anyway. Just use something that we know works. So those were our architectural goals when we started out. Additionally, we wanted to leverage JupyterHub. Uh, this allows us to use the established extension mechanisms that JupyterHub uh, provides. And the result is we have this very elegant system where MSI has to maintain almost no local code and we can give our users access to Jupyter Notebooks uh, in a very scalable way. Uh, so just the, the uh, sort of the quick tour of the flowchart you see here. Uh, the maroon bits are the parts that sort of we had to add that didn't come out of the box of the Jupyter. The uh, white boxes are out of the box components. So I mean, if, if it, those of you who've worked with Jupyter Hub will know that it comes comes with a configurable HTTP proxy that's standard that uh, allow, allows Jupyter Hub to, in a configurable way, route incoming web requests. This is going to be uh, key for later on. Uh, then, of course, we have the hub. It lives on its own server somewhere. Uh, so we added some authentication components. We added the uh, components that talk to the cluster. And then, because this proxy is dynamic, it uh, we can set it up so that these notebooks then, the connections, don't go to the same place as the hub. The connections go through to compute resources on our supercomputer. And then we can use the existing cluster middleware to provide JupyterHub with a way to say, okay, this user has asked for a notebook, let's spin up a compute resource and uh, get them a notebook. So in a little more detail, the components we use to do this. Now the first one is batch spawner. Uh, so we started work on batch spawner uh, not long after I got approval to move forward with making some kind of Jupyter thing for our cluster. Uh, the, the it was obvious the first thing we needed was a way for Jupyter Hub to submit a job to our cluster because that was the obvious way to get access to compute resources. So we wrote Batch Spawner. Uh, it uses the standard uh, job submission tools to launch notebook servers. Uh, it uses the existing proxy to map those connections through to the execution node and really all of the logic there comes down to teaching, teaching uh, JupyterHub to uh, use job submission tools as a way of spawning processes. And then, you know, learning how to parse the output that you get from those things to get the metadata you need to know where to send those connections, to know if your process is still alive uh, or if it's uh, still in a pending state. Uh, unlike many other spawners uh, with uh, clusters, you do typically have you know, some wait time between saying to start my notebook and it coming up. This is very different from when you're forking something locally. Uh, a key sort of insight that we lucked into early on with Batch Spawner was to make essentially everything configuration controlled. And this enabled two things. One, it enabled a great deal of comfort about uh, using this because it ensured that the end users who are connecting through a, a website who, you know, in principle are authenticated, but we don't necessarily trust them to know what they're doing. And ensure the end users don't have input to the parameters that go to this uh, job submission system. So they're not going to, you know, request the entire cluster for their notebook and then call our help desk asking why it, why it never started. But the other useful parameter here is that by parameterizing essentially everything through configuration, it wound up being really, really easy to teach Batch Spawner how to use other cluster managers as well. And so when I sat down to write this thing, we use Torque, so it supported Torque. 
Uh, and within a matter of weeks, I had uh, someone else coming and saying, hey, does this support Slurm? Like, well, I don't have a Slurm installed to test it against, but it, there's no reason why I couldn't. And we added that in a matter of weeks. And after that, they sort of rolled in. And at this point, uh, Batch Spawner supports uh, pretty much every widely used cluster manager that uh, we've encountered. And if anyone here has a not widely used one that they want Batch Spawner to uh, support, do feel free to talk to me. The next component that we uh, set out to develop is something uh, called Wrap Spawner. So the benefit that I just talked about, the end user has no input over these job parameters. Well, that's maybe actually too little input uh, because users may have different needs and we would like to give them the option to request different things, but not in a free form way, not uh, the existing solutions at this time sort of boiled down to here's a text box and put, put in some uh, parameters that'll get pasted into your job script. And now you're back in the terrain of you need, to, you need your users to understand the intricacies of your uh, job scripting language, uh, the details of what resources your cluster provides how. And so th this, this isn't really what we wanted to do. So we instead came up with a mechanism whereby, and of course, again, this is sort of a story of, I set out to do a thing and then I made it really generic. So I, so I wound up with a mechanism that can wrap any spawner uh, within JupyterHub and present it to the rest of JupyterHub uh, as a thing that hasn't been instantiated yet. And all the, all the parameters that are meant to be injected at configure time when you start up JupyterHub now get created at runtime. And I, I thought it was terribly clever. Now, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So the, the benefit of this is that we could not only uh, insert configuration parameters, but we could even swap out the entire spawner for a different spawner at runtime. And we could control all of that through a simple uh, form that we present to the user. And the form that's presented to the user is actually in a subclass, so it's very easy to override and make it fancier than the sort of default one we ship. Uh, the default one just looks like this. Uh, the administrator can set up some, some profiles and those get automatically translated into a drop-down box. But if you wanted to say, add a text box where a user can say, I need a GPU or I need an SSD, then you know, th those are things you could easily add by subclassing that further. And the idea here is that by injecting these parameters into the traits system, then you can use any of the spawners you like uh, and they don't have to know that they're being run through this wrap spawner system. Uh, the original impetus for doing this was we wanted to preserve the option to use the Docker spawner, which we wind up never doing, uh, but other people have, and it works just fine. So that was encouraging. And then the authentication component, this is part, a part we actually did not write ourselves because it turns out that the solution is absurdly simple. Uh, and someone had already written it. This is about 20 lines of code and it, just throws out all the existing authenticator uh, code that Jupyter Hub, Hub has, and instead looks for headers coming in from, from uh, whatever's upstream from Jupyter, uh, which at an institution like ours is going to be some kind of reverse proxy that is already tied into our institutional single sign-on solution. Uh, we've actually changed what that single sign-on solution is in the time since we implemented this, and Jupyter Hub didn't care. I uh, didn't have to change a thing about it uh, because we just told it, you know, continue providing this header. The header includes important information like the name of the user. JupyterHub trusts that and we're off to the races. Uh, so since we implemented this, we've gone from a single sign-on that was specific to just our institute where people, you know, typed in their username and password to a shibboleth-based single sign-on that works uh, university-wide, has uh, built-in two-factor, uh, didn't cha change a line of configuration in JupyterHub itself. Uh, the only important note is you do have to, to uh, do a little bit of auditing of how you set up your web, your web service doing the reverse proxy in this case, because that reverse proxy is now responsible for the entirety of your security model, uh, at least for authentic where authentication and identity is concerned. So you, you need to make sure that, say, there's no way that a user can pass through that magic header on their own. Uh, there's no... Uh, that, that you, you aren't able to reuse those connections somehow. Any well-configured uh, reverse proxy setup, your sysadmins probably will 
already have a vetted one should do all those things already. And in our case, as it was, ex was exactly the case. So that's the HPC notebook service. And then we started to laugh on this and thought, okay, well, we sort of had this expertise around setting up Jupiter. Uh, let's, let's start tackling, let's tackling this as variations on a theme. The first thing we thought about was on Jupyter applications. So the Jupyter notebook uh, service itself provides a lot of functionality out of the box. You have the notebook, you have all, all the different kernels the notebook supports. You have the Jupyter lab environment, which we're increasingly adopting. Uh, either the classic notebook or the Jupyter lab gives you a file browser, it gives you a command line terminal, uh, and they're all fairly sensible. So this is really cool. But there's a hidden bonus feature. It is that because the Jupyter application is this tornado application, it has no problem just proxying arbitrary traffic. Uh, the only restriction being that arbitrary traffic on the user side has to end in a web browser. Well, fine, you, you can do lots of that. So this enabled two highly requested additional services as, as sort of bolt-ons. Uh, one is the ability to run an RStudio server, uh, which then gets proc its web interface then gets proxied through Jupyter. And you can just have a button that says, you know, launch our studio. People love it. Uh, even more ambitiously, you can proxy an entire remote desktop uh, by using the, uh, the VNC protocol that gets tunneled through a WebSocket. And there's totally a JavaScript uh, library that renders that in a web browser. Uh, it is, I think, the technical term janky. <laughs> uh, but it gets the job done for the applications where we've decided to support it. Uh, this is why I've added this note at the bottom. Highly requested services are still somewhat experimental. Uh, the remote desktop bit in particular has been tricky to get working uh, and tricky to update and have it keep working. But it is a thing you can do. And so having all of this functionality uh, that is easily replicable uh, with swappable components fairly composable, because it's all based around these uh, interacting network, uh, uh, network components, means that we enable some additional entirely new use cases. So one of these is application-specific science gateways. As I mentioned, you know, uh, I run the application development group at an HPC center, and a lot of the things we will get asked to develop, you can think of as some flavor of application-specific gateway. And so for a gateway like this, you can duplicate parts of the architecture. Maybe you decide not to use the main cluster because this project has paid for their own dedicated compute resources. So you replace batch spawner and the cluster with those project specific resources and maybe like Docker spawner uh, or a Spark or something like that. It also enables the, the capability to set up transient resources for uh, workshops and training. Uh, you can duplicate a user environment. You can maybe add something like RStudio on top of it if uh, the training wasn't intended to be Jupyter specific. Uh, although Jupyter is so cool that many of the trainings we support totally are Jupyter uh, based now. And then you can de deploy that environment either using our custom resources or increasingly we just use Binder Hub for these things. Uh, which makes it absurdly simple, frankly. And yes, you totally can do the RStudio in the web browser thing through Binder Hub. I did not expect that to work, but it, it does flawlessly, almost. So some of our experiences, uh, they've been awesome. No, not everything's been awesome. So I'm also gonna discuss some challenges. And I've, I've alluded to some of these already. So first application is the HPC Notebook service. So this has been available to MSI users since about April 2016. And in that time, our, our usage has grown enormously. Uh, so we've got about 200 distinct users uh, that, are, that are using this service. We see about 20 in, e in any given week. Uh, and what we've noticed is that this, this usage is highly episodic. U users ramp up, they use Jupyter intensively, and then they ramp down. And this, and this we think, is, is in keeping with this uh, idea that we've uh, identified that HVC is part of a larger research workflow. And so you have users who are off doing their own thing. Maybe they're collecting data for a while, and then they come to our center and do their computation. Maybe that involves Jupyter. And then they're off you know, writing a paper or something. We won't see them again for another year. But some other users in the meantime have taken their place. So when I say we see 20 in any given week, 
that, that set of 20 or so users that are using Jupyter this week does, rotates through. And so over the course of a year, we'll have a, a couple hundred distinct people who've used it. For instance, a scale, MSI supports about 500 active research groups in, in any given year. Uh, that too rotates a bit. So uh, in a given year, maybe 100 will drop off, and 100 new ones will come in. Uh, this, we have a total, total active user count of maybe 2,000. Uh, so I think what we're seeing is maybe 20, 30 percent of our research groups are using Jupyter in some capacity, most of them designating one or two people to, to be doing that work. Uh, another key metric that we track is how long it takes a user to actually get a notebook session once they hit the Start My Server button. Uh, the answer this year was 39 seconds. So this is the key, the key thing that we wanted to enable by making this elaborate wrap spawner, profile spawner uh, mechanism. Because by hand tuning these job profiles, we can ensure that they're well matched to the cluster resources that they're, they're being targeted at. And so users ask, well, how come, how come you know, I can get this size job, but only for, for eight hours at a time, whereas if I want 12 hours, I have to, to use these other resources. If I want 24 hours, I have to use these other resources. If I want this large memory, and so on and so forth. And the answer is exactly this. We want to make sure that this is an interactive service, which doesn't just mean once you get on it, it's interactive, but also when you want to get on it, you can get on it now, not press the start button and then go, go get coffee. So the challenge here has been that it's hard to keep everything in sync, frankly. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, all those different boxes in the flowchart were different computing systems. And and so it's been, it's been a challenge to keep those deployments working together. You have the Jupyter Hub environment, the environment on the compute node, which consists of both you know, the Python install where Jupyter is running and each of your compute kernels. Uh, you have uh, different teams upgrading the languages themselves versus maintaining Jupyter. So this has been a bit of an administrative headache, but we've managed to keep it co all cobbled together so far. Science Gateway role. Uh, we've, we've had a really good experience so far. Uh, the, the top line that, that I uh, roll out for, for my uh, superiors is that we've increased the impact of MSI developers in our proposed projects. And the reason is they don't spend time reinventing the wheel. Uh, we use Jupyter as a core technology. Uh, it goes into the proposals that people write. And we say, you know, we're going to, we're going to use Jupyter in this capacity. Uh, we're not going to have to reinvent this thing. An example is the GEMS platform project. It's a big agroinformatics project that MSI is uh, taking the lead on developing. Uh, the challenge here was that it's, con it's a fully containerized platform uh, and the Jupyter model does sort of, it doesn't cause container bloat, but it does enable it. It doesn't do anything to prevent container bloat because you want to put the kitchen sink phenomenon. Everyone wants their favorite computational tool in the container where everything's gonna run. And next thing you know, you have a you know, five gigabyte container. Uh, this is not how containers are meant to be used, by the way. Uh, it's a much more natural fit for, our, for a virtual machine. Uh, we have uh, recently stood up a on-premises uh, OpenStack class intended for like secure data applications, that sort of thing. And here, Jupyter works great. People ask, well, how do I get access to this thing if it's, a, if it's all secure and locked down? Like, oh, we'll give you a Jupyter interface. You can do anything you want. And they're really happy. Uh, and the other thing I'll note is it is a problematic fit for some of our application uh, development uh, uh, requests because it's so general and sometimes proposers had something less freeform in mind. And, this, and then this is where we go off into the world of you know, dashboarding and widgets and this, and this sort of thing. We try to make custom interfaces that are then taking this highly general platform and squeezing it down to something less general. The Transient Resources role, I already mentioned. We've done a couple of events. Uh, our biggest one was the 2018 Gopher Day of Data, which had like 200 attendees. Uh, we measured, I think, up to 60 concurrent sessions at a time. We did this using the Zero to Jupyter Hub recipe. Nowadays, if we did this, we would just, uh, an event of this size, we would just stick in Binder Hub. The Binder Hub people have, have uh, assured me that an event of that size is fine with the current resources there. I think I specifically asked you about that. And then the software maintenance itself, uh, we've continued to, to take uh, a leading role on that. Uh, so even though the uh, batch spawner and wrap spawner are part of the Jupyter Hub project and GitHub, 
Uh, I'm still the sort of maintainer person for those things. Uh, we've had good adoption by anecdotal measure. There's, there's a number of centers that are using these tools, uh, which we've been really happy to see. Uh, this has also attracted high quality contributors, which is really awesome. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, all the schedulers that aren't Torque were added by our uh, contributors. Uh, in addition, a lot of work has been done keeping these uh, tools up to date and, and uh, you know, relatively bug free. Uh, one, the biggest challenge here has been backwards compatibility. Institutional users uh, were under the impression that they want backwards compatibility. They want uh, to be able to support older versions of software and not redeploy things a lot. Uh, you know, various versions like Red Hat Enterprise Linux are uh, typically cited as it must run here. Uh, and so, for example, it was only last year that these extensions uh, dropped support for Python 3.3 and JupyterHub 0.5. And the trick is that if you're, if you're restricting yourself to features that will work on versions of Python and JupyterHub that old, it gets tricky to use features that are required to support the newest versions of JupyterHub. Uh, and, and so supporting has gotten hard and, so, and adequately implementing CI test coverage has gotten hard. Uh, so my big ask for this group this week is help us figure out how much of this backwards compatibility you actually want and if any of you are interested in doing some hacking help us uh, get these extensions banged into shape for JupyterHub 1.0. And at exactly time uh, that is it. Uh, our experiences about a year old now are written up in a paper that was published in the PERC proceedings last year uh, with links and a QR code and all that. I think there's maybe time for a question. Okay, so the question was for the queuing system, uh, when people are, are submit, press the button, can we give them feedback that, uh, to tell them how long they'll be waiting for? Uh, and the answer is JupyterHub does They've added the ability to do progress bars and, and, and such things. The problem is the vast majority of queuing systems won't give you enough information to really sit, be able to figure out on the fly how long do I have to wait? And this is a complaint that people using queuing systems have everywhere at all times. Is, how long does it take my job to run? Well, we don't really know. <laughs> so we do tell our users up front, you know, your, your wait time will probably be on the order of a minute or less. If it's way more than that, you know, contact the help desk. Uh, and the, and what, what we have found is that there isn't enough information to make it a useful addition to the user experience to add something like a progress bar. Back to wrap spawner. Yes. Uh, one back. One, one more. Yeah. So I think you said something about authenticating with shipyard How do you then become the system? Ah. So there's various ways you can do that. Uh, the two standard ones are either you give the Jupyter Hub, whatever user the Jupyter Hub process is running as, uh, pseudo or privileges to run the, the job submission scripts as a given user, or alternatively, you set up your job submission uh, server to allow su uh, submissions from this node to be run as any user. But in, uh, we do the pseudo thing. But yes, in, in general, the idea is that what you need isn't to actually become the user here. What you need is to make sure that the Jupyter Notebook on the cluster is run as the given user. And so that's a problem for this, the scheduler to solve. Do you know if you get a Java web token with your proxy that gets passed through, or are you just purely getting a header that says this is the user proxy? Like, what can you put in your question for the reports in the report? Yes. Uh, Did you catch my question? Uh, I I don't think you were done asking the question, so can you? What's that? Okay. I was wondering if the reverse proxy um, does it generate a Java web token that is propagated down, or is it just purely a header? That's, that's ah. So, so the question was, does the reverse web proxy generate like a Java web token, or is it just passing through a header? And the answer is just passing through a header. 
Uh, so, so we're actually using Apache to do this, and it's literally just setting a header saying, this, this, is, this is the username, and here's like the group they're in. And Right, it's the remote user authenticator, and you, you just, in its configuration, you tell it, look for, look for this header. Uh, I have an ambition to make a more general one that can like parse out additional information that hasn't happened yet. Right. Okay. Um, let's thank uh, my